Thank you for joining the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Houston for our weekly online ministers forum. I'm the Reverend Dr. Colin Bosson, Senior Minister of the Congregation. These programs are recorded each week on Monday and posted online on Wednesday. They are conversations with community organizers, scholars, religious leaders, and others about how we, are, how we can collectively address the grave health, economic, and social crisis we are facing. The purpose of these conversations is to offer members of our community and all who wish to join us on, online science-based resources and liberation-oriented religious inspiration to get through these difficult and extraordinary times. Today I'm joined by Madeline Canfield. Madeline is a high school senior and a co-general coordinator for the Houston Climate Strike Team. She and the rest of her team are currently working on the Earth Day Live Climate Strikes. She's co-led the political action team of the Houston Hub for the Sunrise Movement, a youth-led climate justice organization for a year. For those of you who are with us for the first time, let me say a few words about Unitarian Universalism. We are a religious tradition that celebrates the possibility of goodness within each human heart, the transformative power of love, and the clarifying force of reason. We believe that we need not think alike to love alike. We hope that you find these forums a source of connection, hope, and clarity. Madeline, thank you for joining us. I wonder if you could start by talking about why climate activism remains crucial during this global pandemic. Of course. Well, let me start by saying thank you for having me. Um, I know that our youth team is really excited that the Unitarian tradition is highlighting climate activism, especially in Houston, where it's so pertinent. So my team in Houston, but then also more broadly throughout the country, the team that is working on Earth Day, has had this conversation a lot. How do we explain what in our mind is a really important connection between COVID-19 and this pandemic and the climate crisis and what does this Earth Day mean to us? And so we see it fundamentally as two crises with such entrenched roots, the you know, intrinsically linked because of the systemic injustices that are seeding both of them. So with climate activism, the climate crisis, we have issues of you know, a flawed economy and the way that we do business and run our industries, run our energy sector and run our just daily ways of life. And it's you know, money, fossil fuel money, deeply entrenched in politics and a sense of inaction for decades. And what a lot of us in the movement, in both in climate move in the climate movement and then many of our partners more broadly, have been approaching COVID nineteen as this pandemic that exposes the injustices entrenched with you know unregulated capitalism and big industry and inadequate healthcare because of the way that we our economy functions and a lack of respect for scientific practices and scientific warnings, a refusal to heed, a government refusal to heed the guidelines put forth by industry, you know, our healthcare industry and our science industry well ahead of time to abate a crisis. So we see COVID as this turning point in the climate movement because it's an example of kind of twofold. It's a precedent for what happens when we refuse to address the systems of injustice that are creating a crisis and when we don't act fast enough and don't listen to our captains of industry who are the experts and who are urging us to make government and societal actions to and to have system change, right? So it's not just a small fix, but a large systemic fix. And then also it's a precedent for big government action. So for so long, climate activists have become jaded within our activism because we feel that no one is listening who, you know, our elected officials aren't listening because they love to purport the argument that such systemic and massive social change for climate action is impossible. We cannot have a Green New Deal because we simply don't have the money to spend trillions of dollars over the next you know, one to three decades to preserve the economy and save lives. Yet now we're seeing bipartisan, really quick governmental action to spend such large sums of money to bail out the economy, to protect the American people, and to save lives. And so 
we're really excited because we think that we can use harness the activi- the energy of climate activists and our allies across the country to use what's happening to say a we cannot have this again and b look see action is possible at such a large scope so we're really excited okay um so you think that you think that the global pandemic horrific as it is and with all the the loss of life that's in, coming alongside it the disruption of the com- economy there is uh i don't want to say a silver lining but there is a lesson that can be drawn that it is possible to take sort of massive rapid societal action um and that if we don't act at the same time it's sort of like you know, it's almost like a warning. Like, if we don't act, we're going to be all in deep trouble because of the climate situation, but we know we can co- collectively act because people are collectively acting around, coordinating around this global pandemic, and that we do have the resources to kind of ad- ad- address it. Of course. I think, you know, when I said that climate activists are excited, I should say, you know, I want to make it clear that I meant climate activists are really excited right now on Earth Week about our activism. No one feels emboldened by COVID that this was, you know, a conditions ripe for climate activism, that there was any sort of positivity. Everyone is heartbroken and this is, you know, the climate activist movement knows and really understands the tragedy of losing loved ones and losing your economic stability, financial stability. We are excited to keep our energies and our efforts focused and to, you know, look at a tragedy, one tragedy and one crisis and say, hello, this is such clear indication of why we cannot do that again and so we are excited to use our efforts for what we think is now possibly an opportunity for the world to kind of reckon with their inaction before and to do something for the first time so it's i mean it's i hate to use the word lesson but it's sort of like a lesson like we can't um that we know that there will be global devastation if we fail to act, and here's an example of global devastation that's come from failing to act on a variety of different levels. Um, and so let's use that to try to move move forward. Um, and I think that one of the things that you said that seemed to me very important was just sort of highlighting you know, the massive bipartisan action on spending to... Uh, a deal with to try to deal with the pandemic and the economic fallout um, and the health consequences uh, is is kind of a sign or is is demonstrates a willingness or an ability to deal with something like the Green New Deal because of course I think the total price tag for the Green New Bill deal is what ten trillion dollars is kind of what um, folks have touted and right now. They've spent 2.2 trillion, I believe, um, on the pandemic response, and today they're talking about spending another 450 billion, and talking about how that's just kind of like a bridge package until there's another big, big package that comes through. So, um, yeah. So there's definitely resources to deal with uh, climate change if there's resources to deal with the, the pandemic. Um, so uh, I think, you know, we're, we're talking, or I'm talking to you, not uh, because this is a global effort, Earth Day live um, and the celebration of Earth Day, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, but, you know, you're really here in Houston, um, like I am, and if, you know, things weren't totally shut down, I'm sure we would have had you or somebody else from the Summer Ives Movement at the church this week talking with us and working with us on, like, what we could be doing in Houston. So I'm curious if you could talk a bit about what Houstonians can do to collaborate with the city of Houston for climate action right now. So what Sunrise personally is doing, and we are partnering with uh, lots of other environmental justice and climate organizations in the city, and just our partners more broadly, is efforts to communicate with the city of Houston with um, our city council members and the Office of Sustainability. We're partnering directly with the Office of Sustainability to get the word out about public support for the climate action plan and even a stronger climate action plan than the state it is in right now. 
So unfortunately, the plan of the Office of Sustainability, which wrote the Climate Action Plan, was, and for those of you who don't know, the climate Houston Climate Action Plan is a three decade long living plan to achieve net neutrality, so net zero carbon emissions in the city of Houston within the city limits. So that doesn't include a lot of the ship channels and ports and refineries because those are wouldn't be more county or um, neighboring counties which is unfortunate, but it's still a big process that the city is taking on to achieve such net neutrality by 2050. Of course, with the Green New Deal, the plan is nationally by 2030, and even so, the timelines of some plans are, you know, 2050 is the absolute last threshold, and most people are trying to decarbonize sooner. With that being said, Houston uh, Houston Sunrise Movement is embracing the plan for the sake of a plan existing and hoping to make efforts to you know, speed the process of implementation along in coming years, but to make sure that we don't delay the uh, presentation of any plan at all. So the original plan of the Office of Sustainability was to present the Climate Action Plan on Earth Day at the Quality of Life City Council meeting. That Quality of Life meeting has been cancelled, so they will not be approving and reviewing parts of the plan yet this Wednesday, but still on Earth Day, the Office of Sustainability will release the plan online, hopefully with a press release. So if you could tell us a bit about what the Houston Climate Action Plan contains, because I don't think, um, you know, a lot of people who are going to be listening to this will necessarily know. The, the most basic explanation of the plan is to get the city powering our everyday sources of energy through renewable energy as much as possible and then to be taking out of the atmosphere as much carbon as we put into it. And this is by 2050. To decarbonize the city using these four basic categories, building optimization, transportation, energy, and materials management which is as the updated language that the city has used for what they referred to before as waste management. Now they're calling it materials management. So much of it will come through government action, but a lot of it will come through government partnership with the private sector. Apparently this came, this was one of the biggest changes that the city made from the draft to now which was, and anyone who wants to can go read the full thing on Earth Day, so on Wednesday, when it's released. But the biggest plan was that the fossil fuel industry apparently did a ton of lobbying and gave a lot of feedback after the initial draft was released, saying that they wanted to be more involved in the transition. Of course, activist organizations like ours, like mine, is skeptical of that, but the reality is the city has made the choice to allow for a lot of partnerships with the private sector to promote, specifically to promote efforts that fossil fuel companies have made to transition to renewable energies. So from my understanding, it's not necessarily that the city isn't going to regulate, but it's that they are going to give fossil fuel companies a pat on the back by highlighting publicly in like media sense the work that they're doing and to put it in the plan. And a lot of the plan includes government action, but a lot of the plan includes lobbying everyday Houston individuals to make certain choices, which my team is nervous about because you can't actually regulate that. But we have to, again, see what the actual plan looks like before we can really break down all of the strengths and weaknesses because we just haven't seen it in so many months and there have been such big changes. So you were going to talk, uh, well first of all thank you very much for that overview. I think it's it's helpful and I think that, um, you know, I hope people will go out and at least skim the 80 pages and I'm sure that over the next, you know, many years and certainly over the next couple of years we'll be talking more in detail uh, at the church about exactly what's in that plan and how we can, um, you know, do some advocacy around it. Because I know that several people in the congregation have been involved in trying to advocate for different things in that plan over the last, um, you know, several months as 
well, several years as it's been formed. But uh, you were going to talk about um, kind of what the Sunrise Movement is doing in relation to the, to the plan, then, as well as sort of just giving us an overview of it. So I wonder if you'd like to do that now. Absolutely. So as I mentioned earlier, the city of Houston is going to just release this draft, potentially with a press release, on Wednesday online. And then on Friday, which is nationally a day of political engagement, climate action, we are having a virtual town hall, and it will feature definitely members of the Office of Sustainability and potentially a couple members of city council, and we'll be streaming it on the Sunrise Movement Houston Facebook and on a YouTube channel and potentially on Instagram as well. Anyone can tune in and at 6 p.m. Central Time on Friday evening, there will be a half an hour explanation, what we're calling a teach-in, about the Climate Action Plan conducted by members of the Sunrise Movement. So we'll just go over what we know about the plan so far. Hopefully it will include more details from having seen it on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And then it will feature a town hall moderated by Sunrise Houston youth activists asking questions of our Office of Sustainability members who put the plan together, and then hopefully a couple city council members about you know, questions about the plan, questions about how people can get involved in the plan, about timeline goals, about holding the city accountable to ensure that this gets presented, about just the timeline moving forward and the city processes. And, you know, especially for if we succeed in asking city council members to attend about their intentions to prioritize the plan. This will, and then anyone can, who views can pose a question. All you need to do is comment on our Facebook live stream or Instagram post and make sure to tag us and we'll be monitoring for questions and then we'll read your question and pose it on our live stream. So we think it's a really great way for people to get involved with that. The other side of that is so though the plan will not be presented to the Office of Sustain the Quality of Life Committee, which is a committee of city council that deals with many things, including the Climate Action Plan, because the Climate Action Plan will impact the way people live, that meeting, it's canceled for this month, so we're hoping that it'll happen in May. Maybe it won't happen until June with social distancing, but... We originally, you know, normally what happens is that city council meetings are open to the public and people can show up and they can sign up ahead of time to speak on behalf of whatever is on the agenda that day or just broadly. So we would have done that and we still intend to do that in the future and we encourage all um, interested members of, you know, the First Unitarian to attend with us. But ahead of that and in preparation for Thursday's meeting, with the office and with counselors, we have a Google form collecting submissions about essentially people signing on to say that as a constituent of the city of Houston or surrounding area, that you support climate action, that you support the existence of a Houston climate action plan and want to commit to urging your city government to prioritize it and to prioritize improving it and implementing it quickly. There's an option for you to kind of leave a comment. People are usually leaving two to three sentences of explanation of just why you support urgent climate action. And um, if you don't want to, you all you really have to put is your name and your zip code so that people know where, you know, which city councilor is yours. And we are going to present some of those on Friday and we'll be saving the rest of them to present when we actually do have our official meeting with the city council. It is available on our social media pages. So Sunrise Movement Houston Facebook and especially Sunrise Movement Houston Instagram and Twitter. People can go on. Um, we'll, the link 
is not in our Instagram bio at the moment because our one link is for Earth Day, which I'll explain later. It'll go back up soon, but the links are still available in past posts if you look for them and we'll repost them starting Wednesday. And if you attend any of our live streams, we'll be talking about it all the time. So it's, yeah, a great resource for people to go to to express their support. So you just mentioned Earth Day, and I think that, um, you know, that would be a great direction to kind of go now, now that we've kind of talked a bit about, you know, what's going on here in Houston, and um, I hope people certainly come online to support you all in doing that. But uh, what's going on with both national and local plans for Earth Day Live? And kind of what is Earth Day Live? Why don't you start with that? Um, Sure. So Earth Day Live is the pivot from plans that began in late December, early January, to have three days of climate strikes on Earth Day. So f way back before COVID, the plans were to continue the strike movement. So if you guys remember September 20th, and we were so lucky to have such a nice large delegation in Houston from First Unitarian Church, uh, and you know, nationally, they were formerly, uh, internationally, they were formerly in people who were striking. It was the biggest day of global climate action in human history. We were planning to really try to blow that out of the water in terms of numbers and engagement and action on Earth Day. It was supposed to be for the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, and it was going to span through to Friday. So we'd never done a three day strike before. We were really excited. Now that we have COVID and no one is mass mobilizing in the streets, of course. What we're doing instead is having this live stream. So it's in honor of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, and this will feature a national live stream, 72 hours, of activists, performers, thought leaders, and artists, and political figures who will come together for an empowering and inspiring communal day, three days of live stream mobilization. Um, it runs, the content runs from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Central Time every day. For those three days, overnight, if you're interested, will just be kind of repeats from the day, maybe some cool movies that have climate-related content or takeovers from international activists. But the goal is, yes, to talk about Earth Day and climate in the climate crisis, but to really show that the fights against the coronavirus and the climate crisis go hand in hand, and that as we work to flatten the curve of this pandemic, we must strive toward the long-term goal of building a society rooted in sustainability and justice. So... We are hoping to, you know, engage a diverse range of viewers with all the different youth activists and big name famous figures who are congregating via the internet with us. And in addition to that national content, which will feature just this range of stuff, the um, primetime hours of which are 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Central Time every day. In which you'll you'll hear really big figures and really the you know, most engaging stories. Um, there is every day at eleven a.m. and six p.m. Central Time, a time slot when the national live stream kind of kicks off and it reverts to this map of local live streams where you can tune in and all the local organizers from these both flagship cities, which are the biggest about seventeen cities across the country that we're going to have the most maybe newsworthy and notable climate strikes of magnitude and size. Houston was one of those, as well as just any small town or city that wants to have a strike. I mean, it's great that you all are figuring out ways to continue to, to mobilize around this. I think um, you know, the First Church had a bunch of big plans around what we were going to do around Earth Day. And uh, I think we're still planning in many ways to participate in some of the Earth Day live programming. So I know that we're doing um, some mobile, uh, uh, a group, like a Zoom letter writing group uh, on, I think it's Thursday, um, to encourage people to reach out to public officials about, you know, asking for climate justice. Um, or maybe demanding climate justice. And then uh, our assistant minister, Scott Cooper, is going to be one of the speakers for the Houston Earth Day Live 
portion of the streaming on Friday, I think. So, you know, we're definitely still trying to figure out how to be involved, even though um, obviously it's not quite the same thing as like all being able to be there in person. And I hope that, um, you know, those of us, those of you who are listening to this are also going to try to figure out ways to engage and to be involved. I just want to also say thank you, Madeline, for your enthusiasm and your thoughtfulness. Um, I found this to be a very inspiring interview, and I hope that, uh, you know, the rest of our listeners um, will take away a sort of much hope from it as I am. Um, thank you and all of the folks at the Summarized Movement for all you're continuing to do to try to make this world a much better place. So thanks for joining us, and thank you to all of our members and viewers as well. I hope that you will join us next week when we will be talking with Professor Anthony Pinn of Rice University about race and the novel coronavirus. If you found this video to be helpful, please consider joining us for our weekly worship service. It's posted online each Sunday at 10.30 a.m. This week I'll be preaching on renewal and regeneration. The service will include readings, prayers, and music by our award-winning music director, Mark Vogel. Thank you to our staff for making this video possible. It was produced by Christian Holmes. Alma Viscara assisted with the editing. We'll see you all online soon and in person as soon as it is possible for us to gather again. And please remember that no matter how isolated you feel, we are all in this together.